Hello everybody, just making a quick little video for um, this first part, okay? And so here we are in meiosis. I thought I made a lecture of this already, but I must not have. <laughs> so anyways, here I am going to make it now. So if my mouse will work. There we go. I'm just going to move this up there. Okay, so you guys, to get started, uh, just a quick little um, notes here. So first of all, you need to get your guided note from this location right here. I'm going to have a quick little video that will have you, that I'll go through some of the first couple parts of your note catcher. And then you're going to use station one, two, three, and four to uh, fill out the rest of that. And then at the very end, um, I'm going to quickly, uh, if I remember, I will describe what I want you to do here for this research project. All right, so let's get st started on this here. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. So you guys, um, we've been, before school got out, we were talking about mitosis, which, um, just a quick little refresher, we know that mitosis is cell division, um, and it's mostly, and so we want to look at some compare and contrast, some differences and similarities that we see between mitosis and meiosis. But we know that mitosis is what how our body grows um, once the uh, baby, the um zygote is formed during after fertilization cell splitting and forming new body parts and uh, things like that happens all because of mitosis so we're gonna look at meiosis now though a little different um, yet same concept applies just applies it different uh, in a different way um, one thing that I really want to point out for you guys first of all though is that is, I want you to understand that myto that mitosis, if you remember, creates two identical cells. Um, meiosis, on the other hand, though, causes genetic variability. It's one of the uh, there, there's several ways in which genetic variability occurs, and mitosis is one of those ways in which we have so profound differences between um, uh, all of us that live on this earth. When we look at humans and and other organisms too. And to first start out, I want to play this quick little video for you, and I want you guys to think about this question. How does sexual reproduction lead to genetic variation? So if I can get this to work. One second. Oops. All right. So I'll play this for you guys real fast. When living things reproduce, they pass DNA to their offspring. Through asexual reproduction, some living things can reproduce without a partner. Offspring made this way are genetically identical to the parent. Other living things, like people, reproduce with a partner. This is called sexual reproduction. Offspring made this way inherit equal amounts of DNA from two parents. Each of us has two copies of every gene. The two copies may be the same, or they may be different. The combined output from all of our genes influences our inherited traits. When a couple has children, each parent passes down one copy of each of their genes. For each gene, which copy is passed along is random and it may be different for each child. Each child gets a unique combination of copies of all of their parents' genes. This mixing contributes to genetic variation. Because they share genes, children resemble their parents and each other. But unique gene combinations give each individual a unique set of inherited characteristics. Looking farther back in the family tree, the parents' DNA came from their parents, so the children also share DNA with their grandparents. But the amount they share with each grandparent is only half as much as they share with each parent. Looking back to the great-grandparents, the children share DNA with all of them, but only half again as much. This inheritance pattern explains why you have more genes in common with closer relatives, like your mom, than you do with more distant relatives, like your great-grandmother. In this way, your DNA holds a record of your family relationships. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so after watching that, um, I want you to think about... Oops, what's going on?
Okay, so after watching that little video, you guys, I hope you, um, I want you guys to think about that, that original question. How does sexual reproduction lead to genetic variation? And <clears throat> hopefully from that video, you saw that we receive some traits from our parent, from each of our parents, one from our mom, one from our dad. We can see that our dad got um, his, his traits from his grandparents. And so we can see how traits are passed down from generation to generation and how um, because we carry out sexual reproduction, um, each one of us is unique. And the trait that we get from our mom or from our dad is very random. And the question is, well, how does it occur? How do we know or um, how is it that our cells or how those traits get passed on from generation to generation? And how that happens is through meiosis. So we're going to dive into this a little bit. <clears throat> meiosis is uh, creates genetic diversity. Okay. And how it does that is through a specific couple processes that are occurring throughout. Meiosis is how our, our bodies make their um, reproductive cells. So in males, that's sperm, and in females, that's, that's eggs. And so how that happens is through meiosis. Meiosis creates um, those sex, um, sex cells that we would um, pass on to our children. And you'll see that it follows very similar pat, um, The phase names and things are the same as what we found in mitosis. You start with interphase where you have a G1, S, and G2 phase, okay? And pretty much what happens there is the exact same that would happen in mitosis. But what we actually start to see, though, is some unique differences. And I'm going to briefly go over some of these right now. So right here you can see in prophase 1. Oh, a couple things that I want to point out. First of all, you'll see that it's got a 1 or a 2. It's because it actually goes through mitosis or through this cell division twice. So when you end up with, you don't end up with just two, you actually end up with four um, cells at the end, okay? But there's some things that are happening throughout here. And I want you to think about how is this causing genetic diversity. So we're gonna dive into this a little bit. I'm gonna move forward. No, I want you to move this, okay. So let's look at meiosis one first. So in meiosis one, <clears throat> Uh, there's a few things that are occurring, and I want to make sure you guys take note of this. The first thing, you can see in prophase 1, we go through metaphase 1, anaphase 1, and telphase 1. Um, but there's some things going on here, and I want to point those out. So in my in prophase 1, we actually have chromosomes. They've been duplicated in, in interphase. You'll actually see these chromosomes line up together, okay? Now, these are homologous chromosomes. Ultimately, um, yeah, let's say that this is a sperm that's going to get, um, that this is in a male, so this will make sperm. This one right here maybe came from the father. This one maybe came from the mother of that parent, okay? So I'm not talking about the mom and the dad, now it's making the kid, because this is just the sperm. Remember, it takes sperm and egg to make that offspring. And so what I'm talking about right here is, let's look at the father, his parents, this could, this chromosome could have came from the mother, from his mother, and this one could have came from his father. Okay, in that sperm and egg that created him. Okay, and you'd see the same thing right here. Now we actually have 23 pairs of chromosomes in our cells, and so you'd actually see 23 of these if you were to really look at all of them. But for simplicity's sake, the di uh, this um, illustration is just showing two. But what you'll see happening in prophase one, there's a couple things. There's one thing that's very important that's happening. It's right here. The homologous chromosomes will line up together and they'll actually exchange DNA. Okay. So they actually crisscross their arms and will exchange DNA that way. Okay. When that happens, they will then line up into metaphase and you can see they're still interlocked together. The spindle fibers then form. And we'll pull these things apart. And in anaphase one, you can see that how this is causing genetic diversity. If you look right here, you can see that this, oh, now this cell, are each one of these cells that are produced, are they identical? No. So we're causing some genetic diversity here because now we're seeing that there's some mitch mat. There's mix mat mitch mitch <laughs> mix matching <clears throat> of the DNA on those chromosomes. Okay, and so you can see that this is causing some genetic variability, some genetic diversity from that. Okay, 
meiosis two. So in meiosis two, this is very similar to uh, to um, mitosis. We have prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and telophase two. There is nothing very unique going on here. It's actually very similar to mitosis. So you have prophase two. These do not interlock because these are not homologous chromosomes. Okay, we've already split the cell, and that they are half the DNA of what these are that they started with. So you can see right here that it is unique. Here's this one right here that's very unique. So each one of these cells is very unique. And what we're going to actually see happen, they will line up at the metaphase plate and um, pull apart the sister chromatids uh, and pull those to opposite ends of the poles. Now what we end up with at this end point are four cells that are genetically different from each other. They are not identical. They are different from each other. Okay. <clears throat> What this does, you guys, is now, no matter what sperm goes off to get fertilized, each one of these would make a different outcome, right? Each one of these would make a different baby, we could say, because it's got different, it's got the same genes, but different versions. Maybe this one has, maybe this one passed on a dominant trait, a dominant allele. Maybe it passed on a B blood type while this one passed on just a, right? And so we have to look at each one of these. Um, they're all very unique and different from each other. <clears throat> so what I want you guys to do is in your notes, um, I want you guys to think about what are some similarities and differences. Fill out this um, Venn's diagram here. And this is actually what your discussion post will be on for this lecture. I want you guys to tell me some uh, similarities and differences that you notice from mitosis and meiosis. I will also post some um, articles that you guys can read because I kind of went through this very fast. Um, but anyways, I'll post those for you guys to uh, read and help answer this as well. All right, let's see. Did I go over everything that I wanted to go through? Uh, come on. Why do you do that? Okay, there is one more thing I kind of want to point out okay and if we were in class we would actually do a big lab on this but um anyways uh when we're looking at meiosis there's a few phenomena that are occurring and there's well there's two of them the first one is how does meiosis reduce the number of chromosomes in reproductive cells and so um in class i would have had you guys model this um looking at how meiosis really does uh, reduce the number of chromosomes in reproductive cells and then the second one how does meiosis cause for genetic variability in offspring and you know what maybe i will have you guys do this i'll put a little um, lab up and maybe instead of just using the material i would have used in class i will have you use um, some material that you would probably have at home to look at this because these are two very important phenomena that i want you guys to be able to model for me so anyways uh be looking for that lab there that i'll have you guys do and uh, this will be the lab. And so I'll put this in there, uh, just a little modeling that I want you guys to do to look at those two phenomena. All right. So anyways, I'll talk to you guys later. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to let me know.